Warning, the following contains graphic descriptions of extreme violence and may be disturbing or triggering to some. Consume with discretion. Does a miracle redeem something truly horrible? Some things are so dark and so tragic that it's hard to imagine anything good coming from it at all. In the face of something really cataclysmic, to even suggest the idea can seem insensitive. The tragedy of 9-11 was one of those kinds of events. But in today's story, we'll hear the account of a man who was one of the first responders at the World Trade Center. He saw the horrors firsthand and claims that the miracles he saw that day need to be shared with everyone and to not do so would make the evil far worse. If that's something you like to think about, welcome to Check Your Head Stories, where we consider the bright side of things that can be quite disturbing, with tales of the miraculous, the curious, and the oddly beautiful. And if you want to help spread the cheer without losing your edge, be sure to press that like and subscribe button. Let's get to it. Check your head. What do you like to think about? On the morning of September 11th, 2001, John Morabito, a firefighter at Engine 10 in the Financial District of Manhattan, was in the firehouse kitchen enjoying his breakfast of pancakes. Like many firefighters and police officers throughout New York City, civil service was a generational and family affair, and both he and his brother Michael were a part of that tradition. They were both firefighters. His meal was interrupted when he heard a loud boom. He wasn't too concerned because in that part of the city, the streets are very narrow and the buildings are placed very close to each other. So sounds get amplified as they echo through the streets. But then someone ran into the firehouse and said a plane had flown into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. John assumed it was a small private plane and probably the pilot had had a cardiac arrest or something else that had incapacitated him because the day was so clear. But the house sprang into action and John was the driver or chauffeur as the guys in the firehouse like to call it. As he drove out the door, he was shocked because the day had become pitch black due to all the smoke that was pouring from the tower. John was confused because in his mind, this was a lot of damage for a small plane. And as he drove the short distance from the firehouse to the World Trade Center Plaza, he kept running over pieces of what he thought were pink insulation that had been blown out from the building. But in just seconds, his confusion turned into absolute shock and the area transformed immediately into a surreal scene that looked like it was from a disaster movie set. Severely wounded people were screaming, crouching down, running from the building. Debris kept falling all around him and John had a horrific realization. He was not running over pink insulation, but these were human body parts. As he approached the plaza, he slammed on his brakes when a man completely engulfed with fire ran out in front of the truck. John reached around, grabbed a fire blanket, got out of the car and ran to attend to the man. He, he, he tried to calm him down and put out the fire with the fire blanket, but the fire he'd been exposed to was so extreme and so hot that he'd been almost instantly incinerated. The flesh was burning off of his body and he fell to the ground and died there on the spot. While John was attending to the man, the rest of his crew ran on ahead and went into the building. Little did he know that this horrible interaction was one of the many events that would miraculously help him stay alive that day. John's crew was the first of the emergency personnel to arrive on scene that day, and they ran up into the building immediately. Because John had stayed back to tend to this man, he was too late to catch up with them. As he entered the lobby, he realized that he'd better stay put. That was the best strategy. If he were to go up and try and follow them and didn't immediately find them, they'd send people to look for them, putting everyone in harm's way. As he entered the lobby, he looked around and saw bodies everywhere completely burned up. This wasn't making sense to John because he wondered how a fire a hundred floors up could be producing burn victims here on the ground floor so quickly. He still hadn't been able to figure out that the building had been struck by a commercial jetliner. As he was assisting people to evacuate, he heard a call on one of the radios of one of the police officers that were there with him. The call said, prepare for impact, another plane is approaching World Trade Center 2. Only then did he realize that they were under attack and the buildings were being struck by commercial jetliners. John soon came to realize why so many people had been burned to death there in the lobby. When the first jet flew into the building, it caused an immediate explosion. 
It also sent a torrent of jet fuel down into the elevator shafts. It ignited. The lobby was full of unsuspecting people who didn't realize what was happening above them. They were waiting for their elevator to take them to their floor as usual. But when the elevator doors opened, it sent a huge fireball into the lobby, immediately incinerating all of them. Now the doors crashed open and a flood of people from the stairwell began to try and escape. Some of the women in running had kicked off their high heel shoes so they could go a little faster, but the broken glass had shredded their feet so some of the men were picking them up and carrying them out. John described it as organized chaos. He said, although the people were panicking, they were looking for leadership and they were willing to take instruction from the first responders. Tragically, people were first being directed out the doors. It seemed like the obvious escape route, but that had a fatal flaw because most of the debris was falling right outside, but it wasn't the debris so much. It was the people from the upper floors choosing to jump and they were jumping 10, 20 at a time. And as they would crash to the ground, it was killing the people running out the doors to escape. John said the sound of the bodies falling on the mezzanine above him sounded like explosions, and when they fell, they fell with such force that the bodies did not stay intact. Even though this seemed like Armageddon, John and some of the other first responders were able to keep their wits about them and come up with a strategy to help the people trying to find a way of escape from the building. Fortunately, there was an underground mall just below the lobby. It led to a series of hallways into the subway and to street exits four blocks away. They were able to direct people to these exits so they could maneuver through this labyrinth of hallways and get to the streets away from ground zero and to safety. The entire world watched what was happening and they witnessed both towers crumble to the ground along with several of the other buildings there at the World Trade Center Plaza. From the outside, you understood what was happening, but on site, John and the thousands of others were experiencing something very different. They were just seeing it from their scope, from their point of view. They didn't get the big picture. They didn't truly understand. John was actually in one of the buildings as it collapsed. He was in the lobby. He heard what was happening above him. He assumed that they were in trouble. He tried to direct people to the corner because he thought the corner has the strongest structure and gives the best possibility for survival. He tried to direct others there, but they didn't listen. Once the tower had completely crumbled, John didn't know if he was dead or alive, but he found himself in total darkness. Eventually he came to himself, he realized he was alive, and that because he'd been in this corner, he'd been able to survive. He looked around, there was still some of the lobby that was intact, but he knew it wasn't gonna stay that way for long. He tried to look for survivors, but he couldn't see anything, and then he realized there was a faint bit of light coming from a window. Through the smoke and through the debris, he could see it. But then, then he realized, oh, I've got a flashlight. He pulled it out. He began to call out for survivors. There were no answers. Everyone in the lobby except him had been crushed. He called out again, and then from the stairwell, going down into the subways, he heard voices. They said, we're here. He called out to them. Their way of escape had been completely cut off when the tower had collapsed and he was able to lead himself and these four survivors through that faint bit of light out through a window to safety. John stepped out through the window and looked around at the devastation all around him. He thought, this is the end of the world. He became filled with a sense of hopelessness. He didn't want to go on. But then he had a revelation. He realized that he had been spared miraculously. If he hadn't have stopped to help the man who was on fire when they first arrived on scene, he would have run up into the building just like the rest of the brothers on his squad and he would be dead now. And how he survived being at the bottom of a tower that completely collapsed above him was beyond his understanding. He called out to God and even though he had been filled with complete despair at the impossibility of this situation, Now he was experiencing something stronger and he realized the importance of his mission. The fierce love and loyalty he had to his brothers who had just perished and his desire to honor their sacrifice and the fact that he'd been able to miraculously survive gave him the drive to keep going. 
John became unstoppable and worked tirelessly for the next few hours, helping wherever and however he could. But there was one thing that was gnawing at him he had to keep pushing out of his mind. His brother Michael, he had been one of the first responders, one of the thousands that came that day, and, and John was sure that he had been in one of the towers and was probably dead, but he had to put it out of his mind and just keep working. At one point, he made his way back to Firehouse 10 to check in. Here, they had a running list of people who had checked in as survivors. Michael Morbido was not on the list. John knew that this almost certainly meant that Michael was dead. But again, he said, I have to put this out of my mind. He said, I'm not, I'm not gonna let this stop me. I'm gonna keep going for my brothers. I'm gonna keep going for Michael. I'm gonna keep going for the people of New York. I'm gonna keep going for God. And he just kept on working. He threw himself into the mission at hand and after a few hours working on site, he needed to take a break. So he walked away from all the debris headed to the street. There was a fire hydrant there. He, he needed some water and he needed to wipe off his face. So he just got down on his knees and put his hands out and took some of the water and splashed it on his face. And he wiped his face and he looked up and then he didn't know if he was having a vision, but right in front of him was his brother, Michael, standing there. The two men looked in each other's eyes. They ran to each other and grabbed each other and hugged each other. What are you doing here? So what are you doing here? And John said, hey, you survived. I'm not letting go of you for the rest of the day. And the two men continued to work together. Michael had also miraculously survived, but he was part of another miracle earlier that day because he and two other firefighters were the ones to find Pasquale Buzzelli. Pasquale's stories has become one of the most famous of all the 911 miracles. Pasquale realized that the building was collapsing and like John, he knew he should head to the corner that would give him the best chance of survival. He went and huddled there and when the building collapsed around him, everyone was killed and he surfed down 20 floors on an 18 by 18 inch piece of concrete and he collapsed and, and, and lost consciousness and when he woke up, his eyes opened and he looked above him and he saw blue sky. He realized he was alive and he was rejoicing until he looked around him. He was seven stories up surrounded by an inferno. There was no way to get down. Michael Morabito was one of the three firefighters who were able to get a rope to him and help lift Pasquale out and get him to safety. That was one of only two rescues that happened that day after the towers collapsed. After working what seemed like endless hours, John and Michael realized it was time to end the day. John said, I'm gonna go check in with the house and the two bid each other goodbye and they said they'd see each other soon. John headed back to Firehouse 10. He realized his car had been completely destroyed when the buildings collapsed. Not that there'd be any way to drive out anyway. So he needed to figure out a way to get home. He, he had some family over in Brooklyn, so he decided, I'll just walk across the Brooklyn Bridge and then I'll make some phone calls. John didn't even change out of his gear and he headed to the Brooklyn Bridge and began to walk across. There weren't many people on the bridge and it was eerily quiet. The bridge had been shut down to traffic, of course, and a lot of the flurry of the day had started to subside. And as he walked across, he had a sense of numbness, but then also the full weight of the emotional impact of the day began to fall upon him and he had what he called that thousand mile away look in his eyes. About halfway across the bridge, John came across a construction worker who'd been standing on the side. He'd been watching John walk towards him. And as John came near, this short African-American man called out to him. Now, John would have been happy to just keep walking in silence, staying in his own head, but in another way, he was happy to have a little bit of company. So the construction worker joined him and the two men began to walk and talk together. The man told him that he'd been working on a roof in Brooklyn earlier that day and he'd been able to see the whole thing from that vantage point. 
John said, yeah. We lost thousands of people today. They were murdered. We didn't have a chance. The man said, yeah, you were down inside there. And John said, yeah, a lot of us were. He goes, no, he goes, but you were, you were down at the bottom. You were, you were underneath, you, you were working. It was weird because the man seemed to know specifically what John had done and where he was. Then he told John, he said, but you know, God has a bigger plan. He said, it's a miracle you survived today and you know it, but you survived for a reason. You got to tell the story. You, you got to tell about the miracles. You got to tell about their guys. You got to help their families. And then he said, you, you know, th this kind of thing happens in the world. That's just part of life. We can't focus on that. You got to focus on the light. You keep telling them about the miracles. And then he reminded John of all the things that were going to have to happen to bring healing to himself and to the families of his brothers and to the nation and to the world. John said, yeah, I got a long road ahead of me. The two men continued to walk across the bridge and continued talking. And John was just oddly moved by the power of what this man was sharing with him. As they approached the end of the bridge, there was a group of police officers who'd just been standing there watching them walk across the bridge. And as they came near, one of them called out to John, hey, come here, come here. He said, are you all right? You all right? He said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, no, no, really, look at me. He said, you okay? He said, yeah, why? He said, we've been watching you walk across the bridge. You look despondent, and we all thought, this looks like somebody who might be a jumper. We, we were ready to spring into action. And John reassured him, no, no, I'm fine, really. And he said, in fact, my... My friend here was uh, encouraging me as we walked. We were talking and he said some things are really helpful. He said, but, uh, but could you uh, maybe get a bottle of water for us and for my buddy here? The cop looked at him and said, wait a minute. You sure you're okay? I said, yeah. Why? He said, because buddy, you were walking alone the whole time. We were watching you like a hawk. There was nobody on the bridge with you. John's convinced that God sent him a messenger on that bridge that night. It was just one of the many miracles that John experienced that day. Since then, John continues to serve as a fireman, but he's also someone who unashamedly bears light in the middle of huge darkness. He's someone who stands for hope and goodness, even in the face of great international and personal tragedy. When people ask John, where was God on 9-11? John gets a little worked up. He said, God was everywhere, are you kidding me? He goes, he was in every firefighter, every rescue worker, every person who put themselves in the line to go in there and save people. He said, we lost 343 firefighters that day, and not one of them started the day in that building. They all went into that, knowing what could happen. They went into that horror, and at a certain point, they knew they weren't coming out. He says about 2,790 people died that day, and he said, that's a shame, that's a heartbreak, that's a horror. He said, but God was there fighting that evil every step of the way. He said 35,000 people were evacuated in an hour a whole city's worth. He goes, that's a miracle in itself. He says, so where was God? He said, God was everywhere. John understands firsthand the horror that happened that day. And he believed he looked evil right in the face. But he also believes firmly that he experienced multiple miracles that day that saved not only he and his brother Michael's life, but thousands of others. He also believes he encountered an angel on the Brooklyn Bridge that night that reminded him to go and share that story about God's light, about the miracles he experienced that day. And that is the greater story than the horror story we hear. John's example and message reminds us to be strong, to be brave, not to buckle under the despair and fear of evil. And that light drives out darkness. So, does a miracle make any difference in the face of evil? Does it redeem it in any way? I know what John thinks, and I know what I think, but I'll let you think about that. And I hope you did like thinking about it because that's what this channel is all about. So be sure to like and subscribe because there's more coming here at Check Your Head Stories. One last note, 
This is the first episode I'll be launching for this channel. And if you would like to have your story shared here, please reach out to me. There's links down below in the notes. We can go on this journey together. I, I hope you'll come with me and we can enjoy finding out stories about the miraculous, the curious, and the oddly beautiful. See you next time.